Well, Chris, thank you very much for hosting me this evening, and I want to thank everybody in the audience for attending. With that said, uh, I'm going to get started. My presentation today is called Cosmic Abandonment, an explanatory synthesis regarding human origins, psychopathy, slavery, and the current psychological and social conditions of humanity. Now, I want to point out here th this term, an explanatory synthesis. Okay, we're not talking about absolute proof here. There will be some conjecture, all right? We're talking about a synthesis of information that come brought together explains, is, a, is an active framework or model for the current human condition. That's what this presentation is intended as. I would like to respectfully dedicate this presentation to the memory of Lloyd Pye. If anybody is not familiar with this gentleman, you need to be. Okay, his work is invaluable, and uh, unfortunately, the truth community has lost this truth warrior uh, this week. He passed away this week from cancer. So uh, again, I'd like to respectfully dedicate this presentation to the memory of Lloyd Pye. I'll start with a quote from Aristotle, the philosopher. He said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And with that in mind, I'd like to give a disclaimer for this presentation. The information contained in this presentation does not constitute a proof. I'm coming right out in the open and saying that. Nor was it my intention to attempt to provide a proof here today. Okay, Proof of anything of such magnitude or covering all aspects of such topics could not possibly be accomplished within the limited confines of a two-hour presentation. Also, please recognize that I am not attempting to convince anyone to accept or believe anything contained in this presentation. I am asking those here today and watching on video, those with an open mind, to seriously consider this explanatory model by asking questions and researching these topics for yourself. Because that's the only way we're going to come to the truth about anything. This is my third foray into the field of ufology in the form of a formal presentation. The first two that I gave, I gave this back in 2010. It was called Don't Count on Disclosure. And I went through all the reasons why not to expect disclosure from any kind of official channels. The second uh, presentation was called Morality and Disclosure. And it involved the moral issues that are uh, central to the ongoing cover-up of extraterrestrial intelligence and the UFO phenomenon in general. So this is my third active foray into ufology. I'm going to give it in three basic parts, three sections, an introduction, and then uh, three, three parts. Okay, So this is the introduction. It's called Starting from Where We Were Left Off. And you'll understand what I mean by this as we go on. But when I, when I say starting from where we left off, I mean this is actually a continuation of my work that I've done in, in other areas, like in What on Earth is Happening podcast series on my radio shows, the interviews that I do on other people's shows, my video presentations, etc. I always give this caveat at the beginning of all my presentations. Uh, there's five essential boxes for human consciousness. There's five things that shut human consciousness down, five models that attempt to keep people rigidly inside of their walls, okay? And if you're inside these these boxes, you're not going to expand your awareness to understand the actual truth of what's going on in our world. And those five boxes are politics, okay? So if anybody identifies with uh, left or right, conservative, Republican, uh, you know, a conser uh, liberal, Democrat, etc., cetera, uh, going to be sorely disappointed with this presentation. Religion in general, and by this I mean the cultural religions of the world. Scientism, not what I call real science, but what I call ultra-rigid skepticism in the form of quote-unquote science that's peddled for modern science in today's world. And of course, the New Age movement, which I've done a lot of uh, recent uh, exposure of. Uh, the, the fifth one is the monetary system in general, the general belief in money, period. So if anybody's coming at their looking at the world, their whole paradigm or worldview from any one of these boxes, good luck. Because you're already putting yourself in a limited confines. And I don't think you know many people who are coming at looking at reality from one of these five perspectives is going to take a whole lot away from this presentation. Because it's coming at it from a closed-minded perspective to begin with. 
Uh, and again, I would recommend not trying to filter this presentation through any one of these boxes. If you do, you're not going to get much value out of it. What I highly recommend is to try to shed these as much as possible to the extent that any of you here today or watching on video are in these boxes. And to really do that, what you're really saying is, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stay in my comfort zone. I'm actually going to search for the truth that lies beneath. Okay, that's not really contained in any of those, that goes way beyond any of those five boxes. All right? So, with that in mind, uh, saying starting from where we left off, my other work really covers that the current human condition is slavery. Okay, if when people ask me what my work is about, I tell them it's about slavery and how to end it. Okay, slavery and how to end it. And that usually gets people's attention. That perks them up a little bit and, you know, puts them in a, in a mode that, you know, they can understand where I'm coming from usually. And, you know, for people who don't understand this is the case of the world, they're also going to find this presentation difficult. All right? So a, a kind of a second disclaimer. For those who do not already deeply understand that the current human condition is slavery, and I'm starting with that as matter of fact, I'm not asking anyone to believe that. I'm telling you it's true. I'm stating it factually. That's the case, okay? I fully recognize that at this point in time, if you don't understand our condition is slavery, you may not even be able to consider with an open mind much of the information in this presentation due to a lack of prerequisite knowledge. Meaning, if you don't understand that, I'm telling people up front you haven't done your homework and you don't understand where we're at right now. So therefore, hearing what I'm about to say, this is like the advanced class, let's put it that way, okay? So if people don't already understand this, it's going to be very difficult to hear what I'm going to say here today, all right? For those who haven't come to that understanding, this is a great site. This is my website. Go up to this site, listen to the podcast in order, and your entire paradigm will shift if you have an open mind. If you could take that information in with an open mind and an open heart, and do your own due diligence, I think you'll start to understand the big picture of what's going on on this planet. So check out whatonearthishappening.com. In whatonearthishappening.com, the main question that I have delved into up to this point is, why is this the current human condition? Why is the current human condition slavery? Trying to get at the underlying causal factors that have led to the condition that we are in now, okay? So all my previous work has dealt with that question. Why are we in a condition of slavery? All right? And the answer to that is provided on that site. Now what I'm going to do here is go even beyond that question here today. But I want to just summarize briefly, as, as quickly as it can be summarized, I'm going to attempt to summarize the answer to that question in four, basically four short sentences or five sentences. Okay. The reason that humanity is enslaved is it does not understand natural law. It does not understand the spiritual laws that govern the universe. Okay, And I, I call this natural law, these, this body of, nat of laws that ultimately govern behavior. I call it, uh, I group it under this umbrella term, natural law. Okay, Here's what natural law essentially is. Natural law is the body of universal, non-man-made, binding and immutable laws which act as the governing dynamics for the consequences of human behavior. Now that's uh, you know, a lot to say there in one breath. I say it's non-man-made laws that already exist in creation that ultimately act as the governing dynamics for the behaviors that we choose to enact. All right, that's what natural law is. Now, humanity doesn't understand natural law in the aggregate. There are individuals who do, but the aggregate body of humanity is completely ignorant of natural law. It's why we're enslaved. Understanding natural law, what is meant by that? It means truly having conscience, which is the definitive knowledge of the objective difference between morally right behavior and morally wrong behavior. That is what it means to understand natural law, okay? Living in harmony with natural law, okay, is different than understanding it. One can even understand it and not actually accept it and enact it and live in harmony with it. Living in harmony with it means exercising one's conscience, or in other words, willfully choosing morally right behavior over morally wrong behavior. 
once that difference is clearly understood. When human beings in the aggregate, the species, lives in harmony with natural law and are therefore moral, again in the aggregate, it doesn't mean the, just the individual. When the aggregate of the species lives in harmony with natural law and therefore exhibit moral behavior, they become and remain free. When human beings live in opposition to natural law and are therefore immoral, they become and remain enslaved. That's how the dynamic of freedom versus slavery works. And this is what I call the law of freedom. That is the law of freedom. It has everything to do with morality and is totally inextricably connected with morality and can never be separated from it. Okay? That's natural law in a nutshell in about as quickly as it can be, you know, uh, condensed. I also talk about this concept, the one true divide that there is only one true divide that separates humanity into two distinct types of individuals. The criterion for this divide is whether or not an individual believes in authority and therefore believes that there is legitimacy to slavery. Someone who believes in authority believes that there is legitimacy to slavery. Again, I'm not asking anyone to believe this. I'm telling you that's the fact of the matter. That is the reality. Okay, And this is where my other work leaves off, explaining that this is the divide that needs to be bridged. All the other things that allegedly separate humanity, race, class, sex, religion, all this, they're all divide and conquer strategies. This is the real divide, where there, where there really is two groups of actual different kinds of people on the earth. That's the real divide and that's the criterion that separates them, whether they believe in authority vested in human beings. These are the two groups of people that, that embody the divide. Okay? These are memes that I put in another presentation of mine. The statists and the anarchists. Okay? The statists is exemplified by a police officer say, you know, with this meme saying, the statism is the brilliant idea that we give a small group of people the right to kidnap, imprison, harass, steal from, and kill people so that we can be protected from people who kidnap, harass, steal, and kill people. Okay? <laughs> And the, you know the meme that I found this meme this great meme uh, with the anarchists represented by you know the archetypal figure of Jesus saying that I'm an anarchist but most of my followers are statists meaning I don't believe in slavery yet most of my followers do so really what we're really talking about these are euphemisms I, okay these are just euphemisms words that we use as euphemisms this is what it really means this is the real meaning. This is someone who supports slavery, and this is someone who opposes slavery. That's all it really comes down to. Those are the two kinds of people in the world. The supporters of slavery, whether they understand that that's the case or not, and those who oppose slavery in all of its forms, in which case I am. I oppose slavery in all of its forms. Okay? What this presentation is going to be about is what happened, okay, such that we do not understand natural law. Why are we in the mental state or the condition that people do not have a fundamental grasp of that truth that I just put up there? And I'm not telling you, again, it's true because I believe it. I'm telling you it's true because that is the universal law of creation. And all, all anybody can ever do is discover it or not understand it. It is there, and what I just stated is true. Okay? So... What we're going to look at here today is why are most people so unconscious that they don't understand that? Okay? Why do they refuse to live in harmony with natural law? They refuse to understand natural law. Why are they so unconscious that they fail to recognize the rampant presence of evil in the modern day, in their midst, all around them, and they just ignore it? Why are they so unconscious that they will willfully participate in such evil, either directly or indirectly? Okay? And this is where my other presentations have left off. And I've been very tight-lipped about the things I'm going to talk about here today so far. Okay, because it's, this has all been preparing the way for this understanding of the, the six years of work that I've been doing over the last six years. That's a long time to stay tight-lipped about something, too. Okay? So, my, my other work has left off with, with, this, with this understanding. I'm sorry, I uh, accidentally backed up the slide here. Let me just move this forward again. I apologize for that. Um, the, the, this um, a whole 
psychological framework, this model that I've built up in my other work. I've termed uh, the, the, the reasons why we're in this condition, the tree of evil. Okay, that's what this right side of the present uh, of this slide represents. Okay, now you have to envision this model. At the top of the model, at the top of this tree of evil, there's all the leaves and the twigs. Okay, and these are the fruits. These are the expressions that happen after the fact. Okay, and the the top expression is willful ignorance. People refusing to look into the truth for themselves, willfully staying ignorant. Okay? Now people will say, well, isn't that the root? Isn't that the root cause? No. That's the expression that follows the root cause. Well, what lies beneath that? What's the bigger branches of this tree of evil? Beneath willful ignorance, people have a fundamental fear of owning their own personal responsibility. We don't want to be truly responsible for our own behavior. We want to pass the buck. We want to pass responsibility on to others and say, no, that's the, this isn't us doing this to ourselves. It isn't, it isn't our responsibility. It's someone else's responsibility. Okay? So the fear of owning personal responsibility goes deeper in the psychological framework for why people are willfully ignorant. Now, something underlies that. There's a reason people have fear of owning their own personal responsibility. Okay, And that is what I would call the trunk of the tree of evil. The trunk of the tree is self-loathing. Humanity is a species that hates itself, ultimately. Deep, deep, deep down inside, nested into the deep uh, underneath of, of the, 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 the subconscious mind, we are a self-loathing species. Okay? There, and that's due to a lack of self-respect. We don't have self-respect because we don't have enough understanding of self. We don't have self-knowledge. We don't have enough understanding of consciousness. Now, what we're going to talk about here today is what is the root of the tree of evil. At the very bottom of this psychological framework, something underlies all of this. A question, and again, I've asked people, please hold your questions till the end, and we will adjourn to the, the beer garden on South Street, Brow House, to take questions and have more discussion. But I will occasionally ask the audience a question, okay? Can anyone please tell me what general group of people this psychological framework is typical of? In general, there is a class of human beings that display just being ignorant, fearing to own their own personal responsibility, and lacking a lot of self-respect for themselves, because they don't really know a lot about themselves yet. Children. Children. Thank you, sir. Children. This exemplifies someone who is not psychologically mature, okay? Who has not psychologically and spiritually grown up, okay? So this is the group that we're really talking about. We're not talking about actual children. Again, we're talking about psychological children, spiritual children. Questions at the end, please, okay? Now, what kind of children display these particular symptoms, psychologically, if you will? Okay, now, actually, that's a good answer, because I would say that gangsters and wannabe gangsters exemplify this psychological issue that I'm going to be talking about. The answer here is abandonment issues, parental abandonment issues. People who have in some form or another been let down or completely abandoned by the parental figures in their lives. And I would suggest everybody in this room and everybody watching has abandonment issues in some form or fashion or another, whether they even want to admit it or not. On my podcast in the future, I'll be talking about my own abandonment issues because I had them. I, I would every if you had them, you have them, and it means you're either dealing with them and you're healing them, or you're not. Okay, and largely what this presentation is going to be about is those who are not dealing with them and not healing them. Okay, so we're going to get deeply into what that is all about. People here today coming from the UFO area, as this is the Philadelphia UFO meetup group, you know, will say, well, what in the God's name does this have to do, foreshadowing there, have to do with these guys? What does this have to do with the entire UFO phenomenon? 
you know? What could it possibly, what could all these psychological issues he's talking about possibly have to do with UFOs? Well, I'm telling you here, I'm going to tell you here today, it has everything to do with this phenomenon. Regardless of what you think that phenomenon is, okay? And I'm not going to get into all the details about necessarily specifically what it is and get into the debates. Oh, is it extra dimensional? Is it demonic? Is it extraterrestrial? Okay? But we're talking about the effect upon the human psyche that the involvement of these beings, whatever their nature may be, has had upon humanity. Okay? The questions that I'm going to explore in this presentation are as follows. Why are there so many ancient accounts of extraterrestrial visitation to our planet, all so similar in the events they describe, yet all of them are just readily dismissed by modern academia as merely fantasy and myth? And I'm going to suggest, no, they are not fantasy and myth, they are historical accounts. We just don't want to admit that there's their historical accounts because of the implications that that would bring up for humanity. Okay? Are human beings actually the progeny of an extraterrestrial species that came forth to Earth, came to the Earth millennia ago, as some ancient historical accounts suggest? Were human beings created by extraterrestrial entities as a hybrid slave species for unknown purposes related to an alien agenda? Other questions to be explored. Did our extraterrestrial parents inadvertently create a host of genetic defects in the human genome, in our species, including primary psychopathy as a direct result of the imprecise genetic modification techniques they employed? Did our extraterrestrial forebearers provide to us our systems of government, money, and religion? And to what ends did they do so? What ends did they provide these systems to us for? What effect did our cosmic parents, quote unquote, disappearance have upon the collective human psyche? And how significant are all these events to understanding the current psychological conditions in which humanity currently exists? What does humanity need to understand to rectify the deeply seated psychological trauma that it has accumulated over millennia as a direct result of its, quote, troubled childhood? These are the questions to be explored. Part one, the story of our past. Now, in researching this whole topic over the many years that I've done so, um, you know, I've come across some excellent researchers. I'm going to talk about a lot of them later on. This is a guy who's a direct experiencer. Many people who are into the UFO phenomenon will know this guy. I've met him personally. I've spoken with him. I've been on discu a discussion panel with him. This guy is one of the greatest guys out there in the whole field of ufology. I personally believe his story, okay? And um, I just think he has incredible insight into the psychological issues behind the UFO phenomenon as well. His name is Travis Walton. People can check out his book, Fire in the Sky. In that book, he says this quote, I have come to realize that the biggest problem anywhere in the world is that people's perceptions of reality are compulsively filtered through the screening mesh of what they want and do not want to be true which is the worst way to research or look for the truth about anything. Okay? If I wanted this to be true, okay, I'd have to be pretty crazy. All right? I don't want what I'm about to come up here and tell you today to be true. I go wherever the truth or the research or the facts lead and then adjust my perception accordingly, not the other way around. Trying to stuff the truth into your perceptions, good luck with that. Enjoy what you get on the other side of that. Because what you're going to get on the other side of that is no clarity, no understanding. Okay? You have to go where the truth leads, and you have to put aside your personal perceptions, this screening mesh, as Walton calls it, of what you want to be true. We're not the arbiters of truth, folks. The truth exists independently from us, and it is there for us to discover or to remain ignorant of. Keep that in mind as a theme going forward. All right? Another quote from the spiritualist Anthony DeMello, he said, It is a great mystery that though the human heart longs for the truth, in which it alone finds liberation and delight, the first reaction of human beings to truth is one of hostility and fear. And I expect it to be no different. I expect to go into a long line of researchers who have been attacked and have had people just totally uh, launch ad hominem attacks against them instead of looking into the information that they're talking about. Fine. 
I'll, I'll accept going onto that chopping block with great pride because I'll, I'll join a, a, a host of uh, characters that actually have character, okay? And uh, I, I'll go into that group gladly, okay? Yes? There are seats up here. We can fill in along the wall. Yep, still a couple of seats up here and back here, so come on up. So with that in mind, what we're actually going to be talking about here is occult information. How many people here expected today to be hearing about the occult coming to this meetup? Oh, great. So, okay, I, that surprises me because uh, that's good. More and more people, I think, are starting to understand what this is really about, that this is about the occult, and this is about occulted knowledge. But, you know, g going into the, the derivation of words, the etymology of words, what occult actually means is it's derived from the Latin adjective occultus. Occultus means hidden, okay? Occultus, the Latin adjective means hidden. Um, and the Latin adjective occultus, in turn, comes from the Latin verb occultare. Occultare, as a verb, means to hide, to conceal, or to keep secret. So when we're talking about information that has been occulted, you know, when people hear the word occult, they think about stuff like this. And I'm not telling you that's not part of the occult, because it is. But we're, we're really trying to get at the root meaning of the word. And the root meaning of the word is hidden. Occult means hidden knowledge. Knowledge that has been occulted has been hidden from other people's view for a reason. Okay? And that reason is as follows. Such knowledge has been deliberately hidden in order to create and maintain a power differential between those who hold that knowledge and those who are ignorant of it. We've all heard the, the term, the phrase, knowledge is power. Okay? Well, when you want a, a certain group of people have a lot of knowledge and they hide that or hold it back or dissuade other people from looking into that body of knowledge, that's creating a power differential between those two groups, between the knowledgeable and the ignorant. So you have to look at it as a hierarchical pyramid structure. Okay? At the top of the pyramid, there is knowledge being held by few people, and they're exploiting those at the bottom of that hierarchical structure or pyramid which lack that knowledge, the ignorant masses. Again, when I started doing research into all of these topics, you're going to realize hundreds of ancient accounts of what I'm about to get into today exist. And instead of going into all of the myriad of different quotes and different texts that I could bring up, and you know, we could talk about a couple of them, you have things like the, the Enuma Elish, you have things like the Vedas, uh, the histories of the Dogon people, the Popol Vuh, the uh, Sumerian cuneiform tablets, of course, the cylinder seals of the Sumerians, and the Akkadian texts, the Srimad Bhagavatam of the Indus tradition, the ba Mahabharata, uh, the Book of Enoch, a huge uh, text that deals with these topics, the histories of the Zulu, the Zulu tribe in Africa. Instead of going into specific accounts, what I'm going to do here today is to try to aggregate this information and tell a generalized, paraphrased account. Okay, up front, I'm explaining that's what I'm going to do. This is a generalized, paraphrased accounting of what I feel from all of these ancient texts actually occurred in the ancient past. Mainstream historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, and academia want to tell you all of these things are just the imagination of primitive peoples. Okay? What I'm trying to explain is that these are not tales being woven. Okay? These are historical accounts that are being trying to be meticulously preserved as much as these people were capable of doing. They wouldn't have went through the enormity of trouble to write down and preserve these things if they were not histories. Okay? They're not myths. They're not fairy tales. They're not legends. They're what happened here in the ancient past. Okay? So with that in mind, let's get into this general paraphrased account, because that's all I have time to do. Okay? At some point in the ancient past, extraterrestrial beings, and again, you could think of it in whatever nature you want. I don't care if you think of it as extra dimensional, uh, as interdimensional, as demonic, whatever nature you want to ascribe to this, they were non-human. They're not from the earth. So non-human, not from the earth, I'm just grouping that under the banner extraterrestrial, meaning from beyond the earth. Okay? Extraterrestrial beings, often described as gods, supernatural entities, giants, or watchers, depending on what account you're reading. 
who the ancient Sumerians called the Anunnaki. That's the term I'm going to use for them in this presentation because the Sumerian accounts of these beings are probably the best known. Okay? And th that, that term, Anunnaki, means those who came to earth from the heavens. That's what the word means. Now, why would they even have a word that meant those who came to the earth from the heavens? Okay? If they weren't dealing with actual beings. That, okay? That, that happened. So they arrived on the earth in the distant past. Their primary mission, according to some of these texts and according to certain scholars who have studied them, was to obtain gold for purposes which we don't fully understand. I'm also not going to get into that argument here today in this, in this lecture. Um, some people say it was to repair their atmosphere. I feel, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, gold has properties that we don't really fully understand. We don't really, really even know what it is. Okay? This mission to obtain this gold was led by two brothers in these accounts. In the Sumerian accounts, they were named Enki and Enlil. Uh, they were sons. They were royalty. They were sons of, of the Sumerian king on their home world, and his name was Anu, A-N-U. After their arrival, these beings started putting many of their own people to work in mining excavations in the area of the world that we now call Southern Africa, Southeastern Africa specifically, a region which they called the Abzu. Abzu in Sumerian means the deep. Now people will say that that meant spiritual waters. I'm suggesting that it actually meant under the earth or somewhere deep underneath something in the underground, like a mine, like a subterranean mine or cavern, okay? After realizing that they did not have enough manual laborers on this mission to obtain the quantities of gold they required, their leader, Enki, devised a, a plan to create a slave species by genetically modifying an existing hominid species that was indigenous to the earth. The, uh, the Anunnaki would use these new slave species to do their gold mining work for them. In this um, cylinder seal, uh, you see Enki here, who is depicted as the Lord of the Waters. He was also called the God of Earth. Ki is the name for Earth in their tradition, in the Sumerian tradition. Enki means God of Earth, okay? So he was also the God of the Waters, or the Seas, okay? And here you see, the, the, this area here represents the Absu. Okay? And you see another Anunnaki. The Anunnaki are, are going to be depicted by these conical, conical hats that they're always depicted wearing. We'll look into that later. Okay? And you see one of the workers here in, one of, in the Absu. All right? This plan is summarized in the following exchange between the two brothers. Enki says, the beings we need already exist. They live in the Abzu and walk erect on two legs. My son, Ningizida, has tested their DNA, which they called the life essence, and it is similar to ours. We can combine our DNA or life essence with theirs to create primitive workers who are intelligent enough to understand our commands and handle our tools, and they will do the mining work for us, and relief will come to our people. Enlil said, re re answered to his brother, slavery was abolished long ago on our planet. Tools are our slaves, not other beings. You are suggesting creating a new species which did not previously exist. Such creative power belongs to God alone. So his brother is horrified by this plan to create a slave species. He's saying, you're trying to play God. That's not why we're here, okay? And again, the, uh, th these are the two brothers. Uh, there's Enki, and I, I believe that's a depiction of Enlil. Okay? This plan is summarized in the fo uh, following exchange. This is continued. Enki replies to his brother, they won't be slaves, but helpers. See the euphemism here that he's using? They're not going to be slaves, they'll be helpers. We won't be creating a new species, but taking one that already exists and giving them more ability by making them more in our image and likeness. Okay? Again, we're going to hear a lot of quotes that go hand in hand with biblical accounts. All right? This can be achieved with only slight changes to their life essence. Enlil replies, this isn't to my liking, and it's forbidden by our mission plan. Our purpose was to obtain gold, not to play God. The Anunnaki decided to put the matter before Anu, their king, and on their planet, Anu convened the Council of Elders, who ultimately decided to go ahead with the plan to create these workers. 
after many failed attempts, and I believe some of these failed attempts were depicted by the Sumerians. Here's Enki again with uh, Anunnaki helpers bringing one of these hybrid failed chimera species before him, who he's going to say, you know, dispatch this, it's an abomination, it didn't, the genetic hybridization we're doing did not work, okay? He's saying, uh, um, uh, well, after many failed attempts, the Anunnaki successfully created a hybrid, finally, by fertilizing the ovum of an earth female with the sperm from an Anunnaki male and inserting the fertilized egg into the womb of an Anunnaki female, artificial insemination, in other words. A male hybrid was born and was named Adamu. And again, you'll see the similarity to the biblical term Adam, okay, the first man. This was the first hybrid species created by these beings. Adamu meant one who is like the clay from the earth, one who is like earth's clay or earth's dirt. Okay? They then created a female hybrid so that the new worker species could procreate on their own so that they could obtain the numbers they needed to do the mining work. They called the female hybrid Tiamat after the ancient planet from our solar system which was partially destroyed in a celestial collision in the ancient past, what we now know, know as the asteroid belt. Uh, they took this pro the prototype workers, which they called the, this species Lulu, L-U-L-U. -L they took the prototype workers to a place called Eden, which many researchers believe is in western Iraq, near the, the Anunnaki base, which they called Eridu. Okay? They were to be bred there in mass numbers, but the Anunnaki's breeding program did not work as expected because the female workers turned out to be incapable of bearing children. And here you see uh, a depiction of this ge genetic hybridization. The tree is always the, gen the DNA, the life essence was always depicted by the tree of life. Here you see a human, probably the uh, Tiamat species, the feminine hybrid worker uh, being created by the uh, female geneticist in their laboratory, which was always depicted by the Sumerians as uh, being a, uh, a, a working place with many clay vessels, which you could look at as test tubes, okay? Meanwhile, the Anunnaki workers in the mines of the Absu were running out of patience and were on the brink of mutiny because they were being worked so hard. Uh, many people uh, called these workers the Ijiji, which were like a, a subclass or a worker uh, race that the Anunnaki brought with them on their missions to uh, mine resources from other worlds. Okay, Enki decided to have his son Ninghizida sequence the genome of Adamu and Tiamat, the Lulu species, to determine why they weren't procreating. All right. So the, the DNA of these hybrids was eventually sequenced and compared with the DNA of the Anunnaki. It was discovered that the hybrids had a total of 22 pairs of chromosomes in their genome, but they lacked two chromosomes that was necessary for procreation on their own. A pair of chromosomes were taken from the Anunnaki and spliced into the Lulu's DNA, okay? So uh, this again is uh, Anunnaki geneticists working with the sequenced or expanded DNA tree, what they called the life essence or tree of life. This genetic manipulation is described in the following account. Ningazita caused a deep sleep to descend upon Enki, Ninma, Adamu, and Tiamat. Ninma, another one of the geneticist Anunnaki. He then extracted DNA from the rib of Enki and inserted it into the rib of Adamu. Again, this dovetails and uh, goes hand in hand with the uh, biblical accounts of uh, hum humanity being, uh, you know, created or uh, uh, other groups of human beings being created from the rib of Adam, okay? He then extracted DNA from the rib of Ninma and inserted it into the rib of Tiamat. He then awakened the four of them and said to Enki, two chromosomes have been added to their DNA. They're now capable of procreating on their own. The new hybrids were returned to the orchards of the Eden where they became aware of their nakedness and ability to procreate. Tiamat made aprons of leaves for them to wear so they could be distinguished from the other animals. Again, this dovetails almost exactly with the tales from Genesis. Enlil was still furious with his brother and with the entire plan to create a slave species as shown in the following exchange. Enlil says to Enki, the whole plan wasn't to my liking. I was against the idea of playing God and you told me that all we needed to do was to modify these beings slightly in order to create the workers we needed. But now they've been given our genetics so they will be able to procreate on their own and have our long lifespan. 
Ningazita, the geneticist, replied, they were given the ability to procreate on their own, but the chromosome that gives us our long lifespan was not added to their genome. Enki replies, what choice did we have to his brother? To end our mission in failure or to do what was necessary and by giving them the ability to procreate, let our new workers undertake our labor for us. So Enlil finally capitulates to the plan, goes along with it begrudgingly, and he says, well, then if that's the only way to do it, then let them be expelled from the Eden to the Absu where they are needed to do the mining. This is the expulsion from the garden, or in other words, the fall of man, story told in much more detail and emphasis in the Sumerian accounts. And again, here you see Enki along with, um, and I might have to change my battery, folks. You might have to bear with me, because I think my battery died. No, there it goes. Okay, it's back. Let me just go back, step back to that slide briefly. There you see again uh, Enki, uh, the god in, in these accounts, uh, meeting with uh, you know, possibly one of the uh, geneticists, and this is the uh, tree of life or the DNA essence being worked with. The new slave species proved to be too intelligent still, and therefore too difficult to control. And this, uh, this is my conjecture. It was probably either because of the infusion of the extraterrestrial DNA that they received that made them too intelligent, or possibly because the geneticist that did this hybridization left too much of the native Earth species, the in indigenous hominid DNA in the genome. The, whatever, whatever reason, the mixture was not right, and the beings were still too, too, too intelligent. Okay? So other modifications were eventually made to that, the worker species DNA to dumb them down even further to make them more easily controllable. This further genetic modification resulted in large portions of disconnected and non-coding DNA in the human genome, which modern scientists have often called junk DNA. I don't think it's anything but junk DNA. It's non-coding DNA that was possibly deliberately disconnected, okay? deliberately made non-coding. This process may also have resulted in the 4,000 plus genetic defects in the modern human genome, including primary psychopathy, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Just look at this uh, recreation of a stele out of this, uh, the, the ancient Sumerian culture. Okay? Clearly, these giant beings enslaving normal human beings, having them on chains, okay? stepping on them, and putting them to work in the Absu, which this region is depicted as, putting them to work in the mining regions. Uh, to me, it's very clear. Let me just tell you something, folks. All of this will be debated and debunked. It's all been debunked. All of it's been debunked. Okay? This will be no different. And I fully recognize and understand that, and I don't care one bit. To me, this model makes more sense than anything else we've been told. And it's there in the ancient accounts if we want to stop looking at it as myth and legend and start looking at it as a historical account. But it's all been debunked, and you could find 10 billion ways that it's been debunked. And I would suggest the people who are these debunkers, who I'm going to talk about a little later on, they're psychological children who don't want to deal with the implications of this information. That's all. They don't want it to be true. That's, that's the only reason they continue to debunk it. It's not that they, they want to look and find the truth. They don't care about what the truth is. They want to keep their tenure in their universities, in academia. Okay? They want their books to continue to sell because they're looked at as the leading authorities on the particular subjects that they talk about. They don't give a damn about what's true at all. At all. Okay? So with that having been said, let's move on. Genesis chapter 11 describes this further degradation of early humans. The whole earth was of one language and one speech, and the children of men said, Let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Nothing which they can imagine will be impossible for them to do soon. So let us go down and confound their language, that they may not understand each other's speech. And from that time forward, the Lord scattered them upon the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Of course, this is the biblical account of the building of the Tower of Babel and its subsequent destruction by God. I would suggest this is the human species that was too intelligent, the worker species that was too intelligent, and was further dumbed down by the gods, by confounding their language, the language that we are all made of, which is DNA. 
Okay? The Anunnaki continued their efforts to control the new slave species and to put them to work in the most efficient ways possible. They greatly differed on the best ways to do this. See? So they wanted efficient workers. This should sound familiar as well. That's what the ruling class still wants, efficient workers. They don't want smart, informed, intelligent people who understand what's going on. They want efficient workers, okay? So that's what the Anunnaki were looking for. They just had debates and, and arguments amongst themselves and what was the best way to do that. Did you want direct, brutal, overt control? Or did you want to make the human workers appear as though they were in control? Did you want to give them systems where, oh, you'll have some responsibility over this other group of people. You'll be in charge. Okay, did you want to do it through, through covert control, making the slaves believe that they, some of them were in charge? So that was the debate that went on between them. They greatly differ on the best ways to do this, so a deeper divide formed between the commanding brothers. Enlil, who hated the whole plan from its inception, preferred to rule the humans with an iron fist, which he felt would successfully end the mission as soon as possible, allowing him to return to the Anunnaki homeworld and assume their throne. While he, you know, um, uh, he was the first in succession because of certain types of succession rights that they had on their planet. And when they went back, he was going to actually become king after his father Anu. Enki, the, the, the other brother on the other hand, who came up with the plan to begin with, he looked at human beings or this new slave worker species as his own creation like a father might look at his children. Okay? His method of control was indirect or covert. He gave to the worker species different systems of belief, including religions, governments, and monetary systems, in order to get them to comply with the Anunnaki's commands willingly by allowing some of the humans to believe the notion that they were in control. So that's what these systems were for. Be belief systems including religion, government, and monetary systems. Some depictions of the gods giving the, the human uh, you know, chosen class their systems of control. So that, that uh, a, a certain group, a smaller subsection of humanity would then direct and exert control over the larger masses of humanity. And therefore would make the, the uh, extraterrestrial beings work easier for them. Uh, again, here's uh, Enki. And here's uh, you know, him giving the obviously smaller and uh, subservient human beings approaching his, his throne some technology. Eventually, Anunnaki males began to take human females as sexual partners. And offspring were born that were another hybrid species with more Anunnaki DNA. They were referred to as demigods, as they were not fully Anunnaki, quote unquote, gods, nor were they fully human. This interbreeding is described in Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God, okay, in other words, Anunnaki, saw the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives of any of them which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for he is also mortal. Yet his days shall be no more than 120 years. He is also mortal. So he's saying here, we may be mortal even though our lifespans are tremendous in comparison to theirs. If we want to exert real control over these people, we have to make sure that they have a short lifespan. They can't have anywhere near our lifespan. Again, this goes hand in hand with the account of genetic hybridization I just spoke about. Okay? There were giants in the earth in those days. Uh, and the biblical term is Nephilim. And also afterward, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and bared children with them, the same, their offspring in other words, became mighty men of old, the men of renown, or in other words, the demigods. Again, this is talked about in, in Greek myth mythological accounts as well. While interbreeding with the new slave species was also forbidden by the mission plan, the Anunnaki on the earth used this to their advantage by placing these, quote, demigod offspring into positions of royalty and authority on the earth. So again, they weren't full Anunnaki. So they took them, they put them on the earth, they let them stay on the earth, and they appointed them to positions of priesthood, royalty, and governmental authority on the earth to make it easier for them to control their slaves. In this way, they interfaced with and controlled the growing human population more easily. And again, here you see um, uh, I believe this is Enlil 
in in this plan, and he's uh, or it might be Enki, and he's he's uh, meeting with certain chosen demigods to basically appoint them to positions of royalty on the earth. Eventually, in their competition to control the slave population, skirmishes and even all-out wars broke out on earth between different factions of gods and demigods, trying to control their different sects, different portions of the human population, of the slave population, which was exploding at this point into areas that the, the original extraterrestrial beings did not even want human beings ex exploding into. They couldn't control the population growth of their slave species, and they were getting out of hand, okay? Even the dumbed-down Mark II variant of them. So, you know, we read about in some of the ancient accounts like the, the Vedas and the, uh, the Mahabharata, um, you know, about these wars between the gods and demigods. And this is a picture, uh, a rendition of some of the craft that are talked about in the Vedic tradition uh, of the manas, they're known as. Sometime later, a cataclysmic deluge swept over the earth, wiping out much of humanity. And this is debated. Was it a natural event? Was it a deliberately created event? but leaving small pockets of survivors. Some re researchers believe this was a natural event, which the Anunnaki knew was imminent, but were incapable or unwilling to prevent. Some say they just allowed it to happen and, and agreed to just allow it to happen and get rid of this problem because they were nearing the completion of their mission. Okay? Others believe it resulted from a physical pole shift which was deliberately created, deliberately caused by a faction of the Anunnaki led by Enlil using advanced technology in order to eradicate humanity, a species which Enlil saw as an abomination that never should have existed in the first place. Okay? So again, it's the big debate between uh, let it happen or made it happen. That should sound familiar also, 9-11. Okay? Um, this was going on back then too. Prelude, the prelude to the deluge is described in Genesis 6. God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every thought of his heart was evil continuously. Now, when you read the word God, just put Enlil in there. Okay? He saw that the wickedness of man was great. He realized, we dumbed this species down. We made a species we had no right to make. We dumbed it down genetically so badly that they are a moral abomination. They treat each other like horrifically. And even the demigods that, that our people bore with them treat them horrifically. Enlil wanted to wipe, them, wipe it all out. And that's what the whole biblical story in Genesis of the flood and the aftermath of the flood is about. They weren't putting animals on boats. They were putting DNA, animals two by two, the essence, the DNA, so that a chosen group or a chosen family could repopulate the animals, but not necessarily have enough of a genetic gene pool to repopulate humanity. That was Enlil's plan, okay? Some people say it was Enki who wanted humanity to start up over again after this deluge wiped out the planet because he looked at it as, oh, you know, this is my, these are my babies, these are my children, and he couldn't let it go. But anyway, God saw the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and every thought of his heart was evil continuously. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created, who I have created from the face of the earth, for it repenteth me that I ever made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the, uh, in the Sumerian tales, this was Ninurta, I believe was the name. Uh, or, um, yeah, Ninurta. Um, he says, uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Again, this means genes, okay? Ge perfect in his generations means that his genome, the, he may have been a, an anomaly that wasn't infected as badly with all of these other uh, 4,000 plus genetic defects in the genome that the rest of humanity was. He may have analyzed some people's DNA and found they don't have all these defects. They somehow magically escaped because of whatever type of breeding was done with them. And uh, he was perfect in, in so far as he didn't have those defects. Uh, and God looked upon the earth and saw that it was corrupt. And he said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. And behold, I will destroy them all. So I would suggest that's where this account actually came from. 
The, the Anunnaki's mission plan was eventually completed. They gathered their people, and when I say their people, I mean the purebred Anunnaki. I'm not talking about the demigods. I believe they probably left them on the earth with the human beings as the royalty, okay, and left their systems with them that they gave to control the worker species. They gathered their people and returned to their home planet, leaving or wherever they came from. If you want to debate it wasn't a planet, it's another dimension. It, uh, again, I don't, I don't care to get into that debate. Okay, but they left here leaving the traumatized surviving members of the human slave species along with the demigods in charge of them to repopulate the earth with the very social systems that the Anunnaki had provided to them. Ladies and gentlemen, they left us home alone. <laughs> okay, very appropriate for this time of the year. A little bit of humor thrown in there for a, a serious situation so as not to make everybody completely deject. I'm going to take questions at the, at the end, but this is approximately 200,000 years ago. It's not the Great Flood 12,000 years ago. Um, some say that's when that occurred. But again, let's leave questions until the end, please. And I'll, I'll take questions if time permits. If not, we'll be adjourning to a restaurant on South Street for further discussion. Part two, the story of our present. So what effect is this having on the current human population? And what can this story that we've just heard explain that is seemingly inexplicable? So. In light of this extraterrestrial involvement in, the human, in human origins, what seemingly inexplicable aspects of our modern world can be explained more readily? I'm going to suggest this following list of things that we see that are somewhat anomalous can be explained more readily. Ancient structures and artifacts, especially ancient megalithic structures. Flaws in Darwinian theory, which I do not subscribe to Darwinian theory. Human genetic defects. The origins of primary psychopathy, which I've talked a lot about in my previous work. Religions, or in general, priest classes in general. Secret societies and dark occultists. The origins of monetary systems. Human obsession with gold. The concept of royalty or the divine right to rule. And authority and government in general. So let's look at these individually, not necessarily in that order. First of all, let's look at how the Sumerians and other ancient cultures depicted these beings. They depicted them in three ways, or some say four ways. Okay? The first was largely human, but dressed completely differently than most other humans in royal garb. Okay? But you see that it's a human being, or potentially a human underneath. All right? So he just ha is dressed like a huge fish. Now they depicted them as fish, birds, serpents. These are the three types of animals, fish, birds, and serpents for different reasons. Again, the, the, this was like scales because that's what their skin was like. It wasn't like our skin. It looked like scaly skin. If some people will say reptilian-like. Okay? So they, they were depicted as the, the serpent beings or the, the feathered serpents or the bird-like beings in many traditions. So they were depicted with wings. So, you, you know, again, their real visage, their real image was forbidden and punishable by death. No mark was to be left of how they really looked. That was punishable by death in all these ancient cultures. So human beings came up with more creative ways to depict the quote-unquote gods. All right? They gave them, uh, they depicted them as human or somewhat human but with wings, showing that they were capable of flight through their technology. And again, you'll, you'll see them always bearing a cone uh, many of the times. This is a symbol for knowledge, enlightenment, and also genetics, knowledge of genetics. Um, and then they depict them less human as half bird, you know, so, uh, and half human. So a human-like body, but with a bird head with wings. Uh, they also depicted them as um, uh, hybrid creatures as well, showing here this is almost like, a uh, again, an owl, like this is Inanna in the uh, Babylonian tradition. Uh, this is Sargon, okay, again, half fish, half human, and always with these big conically shaped heads, with, which we're going to get into again. Again, birds, fish, again, with scales, and 
reptiles. So the, the third way that they depicted them is, or fourth way, as serpent beings. So you'll see they always had the serpent on the third eye in many cases. They were the serpent gods. And I, I believe that this is just, again, a clever way to pick, th this is like a cobra. You know, an ancient Egyptian pharaoh depicted as a cobra. Okay? The cobra headdress showing that they were serpents. And again, it's just it's an allegory to show these may have been beings that had skin like a snake or a serpent. Again, these elongated heads that we're going to look into in more depth. The most forbidden way to depict them was in the ways that were closest to how they may have actually looked. People who made things like this probably were punished by death if they were found. And that, this is the idea of uh, uh, the idea, you shall make no graven images. That's where that comes down to in biblical terms. Okay? Uh, other seemingly anomalous artifacts can be described. Here you have what looks like astronauts. And these are like 2,500 years old or more. Okay? Um, I believe these are, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Akkadian or Assyrian. Uh, don't hold me to that, though. Um, and look at this one, clearly looking like a, a serpent or breathing through a gas mask of some kind, clearly with technology on them. Now, look at some, I'm sorry, let me go back a slide. Look at some of these elongated skulls. Okay, now, people will look at these, and the first thing they're going to say, it's all been debunked, cradle boarding. Okay? These are not cradle boarded skulls. I'm going to try to prove that to you, that these aren't cradle boarded. All right? These aren't human skulls. And people will say, oh, DNA tests have been done, they're human. DNA tests show that part of them is human. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not going to tell you these are Anunnaki skulls. I think these are demigod skulls. Again, I believe the Anunnaki rounded up their people, or if they did not, they're certainly not living, allowing them to die and perish on the earth. But I do think these may be hybrids between the original beings and the, their creations, which was forbidden for them to be doing, but they did it anyway. The sons of God coming unto the daughters of men. So um, when we look at these skulls, they only have one parietal plate. All human beings have two parietal plates. Okay? These be beings were born with these so-called anomalous features. Just let's look at a few of them, and I'll get into some of that, how this is not cradle boarding. Secondly, they're of enormous size. The cranial capacity holds up to three or four hundred cubic centimeters more brain matter than a human being. Cradle boarding does not change cubic volume of the skull. All it does is compress the skull. But you're not going to make it hold more cubic volume of brain material. In this case, these skulls hold upwards of 30 percent more brain material. One third fully larger than a normal human brain capacity. And again, you'll find anthropologists, archaeologists, uh, traditional academic historians that will debunk all of it in the most ridiculous ways they can debunk it because they will say anything not to get people to start studying this information. They don't want, they want the occult to remain the occult. They want it to remain hidden because the best way to control somebody is to cut them off from their origins. You cut off a people from their true origins, and you own them. You own them. And that's what they're trying to continue. Okay? Look at the height on that. You're not going to accomplish that in an adult with cradle boarding. I don't care how much you cradle board a child. You're not going to accomplish that. Another completely anomalous skull. That one, I believe, does have two parietal plates, which makes it even more anomalous. Okay, here you see... Um, the, the, there's, there's almost no suturing in some of these skulls. This one, no typical suturing ar around the back. I, I, I believe I have um, not images of that one, but uh, of another one that shows the back of a really large one like that. Th there you could actually, sorry. Let me move forward again. <clears throat> Yeah, here you could see, this is one plate going all the way up and all the way around. Hardly any suturing in the skull. A huge one. 
much larger than a typical normal human skull. Some with hair left intact. Okay, here's a comparison. That's a normal human skull. That's one of these skulls. Now, people will say this is cradle boarding, okay? This is what a cradle boarded skull looks like. That's an example of cradle boarding in an in a infant or you know, a very, very young baby. And then that's an extreme example of cradle boarding. Now, you can get, get it to go, look like that, but you are not going to change the cubic volume of the brain material, all right? Cradle boarding is a type of skull binding that leads to cranial deformation. And it can account for some elongated skull findings. But many others appear to be genuinely anomalous, having just one parietal plate and a heart-shaped dome at the rear of the skull that cannot be achieved through cradle boarding. Okay? So I believe what the ancients and even some modern people were, are doing with cradle boarding is to try to emulate the look of the gods. They're trying to emulate the look of what the gods and demigod skulls looked like. I believe that's what circumcision is also about. Circumcision is about trying to emulate the look of the gods, the, the, the penis, the phallus of the gods. Okay? The, this is a normal human skull, A, up here. Okay? B is what an extreme example of cradle boarding ends up looking like, again, these are all oriented in the same basic direction. Front of the skull at the bottom, back of the, back of the skull, parietal plates, occipital plates, okay? This is a, a cradle boarded skull, and you see here's the plate that divides the frontal lobe plate from the parietal lobe plates of the brain, okay? And you see this suturing pattern that goes, you know, this goes across, and then you have the suture that goes uh, across the, the uh, middle of the top of the head and separates the two parietal plates. This one has no such suture. It's all one huge skull cap, one parietal plate, okay? This is an overhead view of one of these skulls. This is, this is the front of the head, this is the back. Again, again, the elongated back, okay? One suture across that part, separating the frontal plate from the parietal plate, one parietal plate. Whatever that is, it's not a normal human skull. Okay, and look now look at how they depicted these beings. We have some of these skulls. This is how they were depicted, always with these headdresses covering up the elongated skull. Okay, again. Again. Constantly in all the pictures. I'm sorry, let me step that back. Again, an elongated skull in royalty. The royalty is always depicted as having these elongated skulls, not the general population. The royalty here with Ana, uh, Akhenaten and his family. Enki. I believe that's Akhenaten again. Here's some royalty uh, in uh, females. I believe that was Akhenaten's daughter or wife, if I'm not mistaken. And look at the side-by-side -side comparison. Okay, so that's the depictions of the gods. We see a lot of depictions of advanced technology, okay? I believe uh, this is at uh, uh, Dendera, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they depicted these uh, possible form of uh, power generation that was being done by some of these beings. And you see, again, the size difference between the gods and demigods and the regular humans. When you look into the ancient megalithic structures, you're going to see clear signs of machining, if you're honest with yourself. They didn't carve these things with copper tools, folks. Okay? The architecture is so unbelievable, we could, would have a very difficult time accomplishing it today if we could at all. All right. Now, this is at uh, Abydos, which is a really uh, a holy center in Egypt in the Egyptian uh, religious tradition. Um, they claim this is uh, overlapping of two pharaonic um, seals or uh, cartouches, and that the Egyptians left the old one up and carved over top of it. 
It would be the only place that the ancient builders in Egypt ever did this, instead of taking down that facade and do, putting a fresh one and putting it up in place. But no, they, they, in millions of other places, they would never have dreamed of doing that in their architecture and building techniques and styles. But in the holiest place of Egypt, they decided, oh, let's not take the time and just let's, let's you know, carve this cartouche over an existing one. I don't buy it. I, I don't accept that as an explanation. I don't care how many historians tell me that that's the case. I don't accept it as an explanation because it is anomalous according to all the ancient building techniques and they just wouldn't have done it out, out of, I don't even care if you didn't want the other pharaoh's name seen like they did with certain people like, like Hatshepsut, etc. Okay? They would not have done this at, at the temple, uh, the temples at Abydos. Wouldn't have been done. Okay. So I do believe that this does depict some ancient technology that they used. Uh, again, uh, genetics, always depicted as the tree of life or the separated world tree. And I believe that this may have depicted by the Sumerians, depicted that these beings did in fact fly in hovercraft or anti-gravitic craft. And here, again, fish god depicted. And we'll see that in a moment. Um, the ancient structures that we find all around the world, they came from a unified world civilization that existed in the, in the past. We cannot duplicate this technology today. We couldn't build the pyramids of today. Could not build the Great Pyramid with all the technology that we have with the precision that it is built. Couldn't be done, okay? And then people never ask the question, why? All the debunkers want to debunk all the methodologies. They never want to ask the question, why was it done this way? Why? Never talk about that question. That question is forbidden. God forbid we ask that question. The megalithic builders built things we could scarcely approach in the modern world at places like Egypt, at uh, the, you know, uh, Machu Picchu in Peru. This is Saxe Waman uh, outside of Cusco in Peru. Look at the building technique of these blocks. They fit together so perfectly you couldn't put a razor blade, a thin razor blade from a utility knife could not be inserted between any of those stones. There's, we don't have that type of construction ability today. And especially with completely irregular geometries. And people will say they shape these with copper tools. Right. <laughs> copper tools that are seven times less hard in hardness than this stone. Seven times less hardness. You're going to shape stones like that. Good luck. I mean, the, the, the explanations are so ridiculous. They're joke laughable. Joke, big belly laugh joke laughable. Okay? This is a uh, stone that was being quarried at, near Baalbek in Lebanon. 1,200 ton stone that was abandoned. We don't know why. 1,200 tons. 1,200 tons. The Osirion Temple at Egypt, in Egypt, okay? The, 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 the older construction that was built on top of this, you could see up here, is nowhere near this type of megalithic construction. And these are like 20 ton stone blocks, some of them up to 40 tons. This is Baalbek, Lebanon. Uh, this stone is estimated to be 800 tons to 1,000 tons. And this is uh, another megalithic construction at, in Bolivia. This is um, Puma Punku. Puma Punku. And you can see clear signs of machining. If you look in, at Puma Punku, they actually have small drilled holes through some of these stones. Look into this site in Bolivia. Unbelievable. Clear signs of machining. And yet, classical archaeologists and anthropologists would say, no, these stones are not machined. I mean, a modern engineer can look at this and tell this is machined. That's not carving, that's machining. I mean, it's, but it's like, it's the same way we can look at the buildings coming down on 9-11 and say that's a collapse and not an implosion, you know? People will, will dream up what they want to dream up because they want something to be true or they don't want something to be true. Keep that quote by Walton in mind. Yeah. Uh, this I'm going to uh, bring in from some of Lloyd Pye's work again, who this presentation is dedicated to. These are 12 ways that Lloyd Pye talked about that human beings aren't 
actual primates. That, you know, classical uh, anthropologists say that we're primates and descended from primates, but really we don't exhibit the characteristics of primates. Human bones are much thinner and lighter than primate bones. This is a human finger bone and a primate finger bone, a human femur, a human femur and a primate femur. The density is not, nowhere near each other. You know, if we're supposed to be, uh, you know, advanced evolutionarily from the earlier prototype, it looks like we took a step back. We're much weaker than they were. Okay, our muscles are five to ten times weaker. That's why don't get in a scuffle with uh, uh, an orangutan because you will be torn apart. Okay, uh, skin is not well adapted to direct sunlight. Our skin, whereas they are naturally adapted to living on the earth outside. We're the only really animal that is not adapted to living on this planet, if you think about it. We're not naturally adapted to living on the earth. Why would we be the only animal that's not naturally adapted to be living on the planet in which we're supposed to put supposedly the epitome of evolution on? Um, we have 10 times as much as adipose tissue, fatty tissue, dr drastically less body hair, and the patterns are reversed. Hair on the male front as opposed to you know, the, the backs, whereas apes have hair on the back and a hairless front. Head hair and nails must be trimmed for, for us, not with uh, hominids. Uh, skulls and brains are completely different. Okay? You know, these are hominid skulls, and there's a human skull, and no, no uh, missing link has ever been found. Scientists are telling us since the whole theory of Darwinian evolution has been concocted that, oh, you know, we're going to find this missing link. We're going to find the evidence of transitional species. Darwin himself would have been opposed to his own theory today. This was picked up by social Darwinists, eugenicists, and social engineers to play into their advantage to control the slave species. Okay? Um, no transitional species have been found between the hominids and humans. It's not there. You know what? It's not going to be there. It's not going to be found. Want to know why? Because there is no connection. There is no connection, okay? Uh, you know, they, they also want to tell us this change happened evolutionarily almost overnight, and these old species went out, and the new one, Homo sapiens sapiens, came in. There's a reason that we came in practically overnight, and I just talked about it in the past section, okay? Uh, drastically different locomotion. Another thing Pi's work really got into was how drastically redesigned the human foot is in comparison to a hominid foot. A hominid foot has a straight on pattern, okay? When you step down with the heel, the weight distribution is even and it pushes off across the whole front of the foot, okay? With our foot, it goes around the arch and weight has to be completely distributed, redistributed on the fly. It's a completely inferior design compared to the hominid foot, all right? Uh, so that's what he's talking about here when he says drastically different locomotion. We're capable of speech because our throat is completely redesigned from hominids. There are no signs of typical estrus cycles in human beings. That means going into cycles of, of heat, uh, going in heat like uh, uh, primates do. Uh, we have 4,000 genetic disorders in the human genome, and our chromosomes are reduced from a primate's 48 to a human's 46, 23 from each parent. Going back to what I was talking about, you could look at bones that are found in all primate species, all hominid and primate species. There is exactly zero bones, okay, from the hominid races in the human skeleton. Zero. There are zero transitional bones in the skeletons from hominids to human. There are zero transitional species with a mixture of hominid and human bones. Zero in the fossil record. And no anthropologist or archaeologist will debate that because it doesn't exist. Okay? But we want to think we are just totally, you know, somehow a uh, descendant from the hominids. We're not a descendant from the hominids, we're hybridized from them with another species. Moving on. 
The human chromosome number two is one of the big pieces of the puzzle that people really need to look into, okay? I tell people if you want to really understand the story of the ancient past and you're from a left brain scientific bent, start with human chromosome number two because this is a fused chromosome, okay? Here it is right here, right there. This is human chromosome one, this is human chromosome three, okay? This is chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan, all right? You could see the difference in the hominid chromosome, number two. But this one, it appears to be fused at the telomeres, which is the end of the chromosome, all right? The typical response in biology, in genetics, and anthropology is that this was a naturally occurring splicing or combination of that much genetic material. Well, and people think, oh, that's just a little bit of material. This would probably require, if that kind of splicing were to happen naturally, at least, at least 10 million years, according to classical Darwinian theory of how fast evolution moves. And I'm just estimating that, okay? They want to tell us, modern geneticists and biologists want to tell us that happened in 40,000 years. In 40,000 years, that much genetic modification happened. And what, I, what I'm going to say is I think that's a deliberate modification that came through in the second modification that was done to us, the dumbing down modification that I talked about in the story, okay? Look into human chromosome number two. It's enlightening, although it may be a horror story, it's very enlightening. And I highly recommend Lloyd Pye's work with that as well. This may explain why psychopathy exists in the human species. See, many people don't even want to admit psychopathy exists. I get emails constantly, you're wrong. There's no such thing as psychopathy. There's no such thing as psychopathy. This is an in invented human neuroses or disease just like all the other things in the DMA, okay? And, and it's all there to just get people to believe that they have these mental disorders like ADHD, et cetera. And people can't see with their own eyes that psychopaths really exist. They don't want to admit it. Again, it's coming from the perspective, I want to be the arbiter of truth because I'm not comfortable with that existing. I don't want it to be true, okay? Now, even the people who admit psychopathy does exist, and psychopathy will get into the characteristics, but they never wrestle with that horrible question. Why does it exist? That's the implications no one wants to deal with. Why are we on a planet where people with these characteristics exist at all? And are born, I'm talking about primary psychopathy, being born like this. And believe me, there are people who are born like this, born that way. So there's three, there's three possibilities. Well, either God did it to us, and I mean the God of creation, just made humanity this way and, you know, put this other subspecies that's an interspecies predator on the earth with us to just have its way with the normal humans, okay? And that would be an interesting uh, dynamic to wrestle with, you know, Im implication-wise on its own. The other possibilities are we might have done it to ourselves, okay? But in that case, you'd have to say we were ancient geneticists and we did this to ourselves for some crazy reason. That doesn't resonate with me. The other thing is it happened as a result of this ancient hybridization that was done to us by another species. I, think, I don't really think you can have any other possibility where people say, oh, it just crept into the human genome by genetics. You know, uh, I don't see evolution just doing that naturally. You know, having a subspecies with all these characteristics, which are the characteristics of a psychopath. Let's look at what they are. <clears throat> the absence of any conscience or empathy. Inability to feel. And there's a reason for this. The psychopath has a malfunctioning midbrain. The midbrain, which is called the limbic system, doesn't work normally. It's electrochemically malfunctioned in comparison to a normal human brain. So when the midbrain or the limbic system is malfunctioned, it doesn't produce the chemical, the, 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 the neuropeptides that go into the bloodstream and enable the human physiology in the body to feel 
emotions, to actually feel what we do to others. That doesn't work in the psychopath. That part of the biochemical interaction between the brain, the neuropeptides, the human nervous system is broken in the limbic brain in a psychopath. It's broken from birth. And I'm, and, and I'm, th this is also, just so we're clear, this is also something that is capable of being created through social conditions. Social conditions can breed secondary psychopathy. I'm not talking about secondary psychopathy. People being in a situation that puts them under such chronic stress that their brain starts to work like a psychopath, a real psychopath's brain. There's two kinds of psychopaths. Primary meaning born that way and secondary meaning you become that way through social conditions that you can't escape from. Okay? I'm talking about primary psychopathy here. Why would there be a class, a subclass of the human species that is born without the ability to empathize with their fellow human beings? Okay? So they're strongly immoral, aggressive, callous, and cunning. They are very adept at manipulating others. They are willing to engage in criminal conduct to get their way. They, are, they possess a deceptive ability to appear outwardly benevolent and to fake or feign normal human emotions. They're good actors. They can role play and pretend to have normal human emotions, which they absolutely do not feel and are incapable of feeling. Okay? They have a complete absence of guilt or remorse for the harm they cause to others. They deny their behavior, they rationalize their behavior, and they transfer blame to others. They have complete contempt for other people's feelings. Doesn't matter how you feel, especially even if I, you know, cause you to feel that way as a result of my behavior, I could care less. Pathological liars refuse to accept responsibility for any of their behavior, and they believe that they will never be brought to justice by anyone for all of the wrongdoing that they do. That's what a psychopath is. And I'm telling you, they're here, they're among us. Clinical psych psychologists place the number between 1 and 4%. I disagree with those numbers. I think they're much over-exaggerated. I think real primary psychopaths, I think, are less than a half of 1%. Pr I, maybe even less than that in the human population. Maybe a tenth of 1%. Okay. But what I am going to tell you is there's many secondary psychopaths in the human population, maybe upwards of 15 to 20 percent, okay? A lot of secondary psychopaths are roaming the earth, all right, because of the social conditions of the earth. Very few primary psychopaths. But I'm suggesting that one may have created psychopathy along with the other 4,000 human genetic defects. You know, you have things like, you know, different neurological disorders, different, you know, uh, birth uh, degener degenerative disorders, things like Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's disease. We, we don't, the, the, all of these different disorders in the human genome, the, the explanation for these may be because of this genetic modification. When you do a genetic splicing with, imprecisely, because you don't really care about what you're making, you know, it's something you're using and then getting rid of. That's how we really look at as, all right? You're not going to do it with atomic precision. It wasn't done with atomic precision. It was done the same way modern human geneticists do genetic splicing, which is with chemical cultures. My friend was a genetics engineer for some time. He told me, you put it in the culture, you add whatever agent or reagent you're adding to, to break it down and to create the separation or the splicing, and then you have to let it express. That's how modern genetics is done. You're not splicing things at an atomic level that preserves the exact base pairs of the DNA at an atomic level. Therefore, all, all kinds of bit errors are going to creep into that code when you do it in this imprecise fashion. That's going to create different unforeseen circumstances, and I feel human psychopathy is one of them. I think that's what the origins of psychopathy are primary psychopathy. This explains all the accounts that are seemingly inexplicable in tradi traditional religious beliefs. In biblical faith, you know, the, the Old Testament punishing God. This is these beings who had to have their will done exactly as they wanted by their slave species. Look at the very specific detailed things that God asks human beings to do in biblical accounts. 
you know, bring them certain kinds of foods, do certain kinds of exacting work. You know, why would the God of creation give us orders like that? The gods were pretty vain and wanted their will served at all times and places. So they would have asked human beings to do all kinds of vain things for them. You know, you see like the uh, biblical account of uh, David and Goliath. I believe this is a uh, human starting to fight back against the demigods who were put in place to control them more viciously. Modern religion, I think, is a, a holdover from the days when these gods put certain human beings into positions of power and created priest class, a pr uh, you know, priest classes so that they could control the overall populations more effectively. And who did they ask them to worship as their gods? They asked them to worship these extraterrestrial beings. Because if you did what they wanted, they would bestow favors upon you. And you would get a little bit more food or a little bit more blankets or a little, a little bit better housing. Okay? If you just did their bidding and didn't ask questions and went along with everything they asked you to do like a good little slave. Okay? And, you know, I just want to just, I'm going to take a lot of pot shots at people in this presentation. I don't care who it offends. I don't care if it offends you in the room. I don't care if it offends whoever's watching. I'm going to get scathing toward a couple of groups, few groups of people in the world who I think are keeping the dynamic of human slavery in place. And religionists are one of them, particularly priest classes. Okay? Because where are these people talking about the police state that's running rampant in our culture? Where are these people talking about the wrongness of slavery that's running rampant in our culture? Okay? Where are they? No, they won't talk about that. You know, they just want you in their churches and synagogues and, and mosques to throw as much money into their system as they can. And they're not going to talk out against Big Daddy government. Not a bit. Because then they lose their 501c3 statuses. You know? And then people come after them for the taxes like they do everybody else. Okay? So these aren't holy men. They're nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind. The people who are doing the real great work to warn humanity about the slavery that's ongoing and needs to end are the holy men of this world. Not these people. Not a bit. Okay? And I mean, uh, if you can't see the similarity, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you if you can't see it. Could it be any more clear that they're trying to emulate the gods? You know? You know, uh, that speaks for itself. If I need to say anything there, something's really wrong. <laughs> this is where the mystery tradition, mystery schools, and secret societies of the modern day come from. Because the gods created these, how, these temples of knowledge, centers of knowledge that they gave some knowledge to few people in order to control the masses of people. A hierarchical structure based on occulted information, occulted knowledge. Okay? So this is where modern secret societies come out of the ancient world to us from. And then of course from there you get the dark occult. You get Satanism and dark Luciferianism and the, the order of death and the, the Bohemian Club, etc. The dark variant of the Illuminati, if you will. Okay? Which means illuminated ones. They're nothing of the kind illuminated. They're frauds and fakes. The real illuminated people are the people who are trying to tell people the truth about what's going on on this planet because they have that knowledge. And they're trying to share it with people. They're the illuminators. Those who bring that light to other people. So calling these clowns the illuminated ones is a misnomer. All right? But, you know, they're Satanists most, most certainly. All right? And that's where these groups come out of. Again, coming out of knowledge being held and preserved for the few in the ancient world to control, and then they come forward through into the modern world as these different dark uh, orders. The obsession with gold, okay? And just the concept of money in general. People never ask, where did money come from? You know where money came from? The gods gave us the concept of money. They gave us the concept of money to keep people fighting with each other and create a class system so that there would be a hierarchical order of control, which they wanted. Okay? We don't know why they valued gold. 
you know, Sitchin and other researchers have you know, postulated that they were trying to do something technological in their atmosphere. I don't know whether I buy that explanation or not. I, look, gold is eternal. You can put gold at the bottom of the ocean. You bring it up, it's like the day you put it, you can bring it up 10,000 years later, it's going to be like the day you put it there. What is that? We don't even understand the real properties of gold. We don't understand what this substance even is or how these beings used it. And there's accounts these beings used it internally as well. Many of the pharaonic accounts of, in ancient Egypt, these, these demigods consumed the gold that they made in monoatomic form. We don't really understand the essential qualities of what gold is or how these beings used it, but they considered it valuable. So they transferred this value to the human populations. Whenever you went into all ancient cultures that had mined gold, smelted it, and you asked yourself, why would they have mined and smelted gold? Do you know how difficult that process is to do? The amount of work it takes to even get a little bit of gold out of ore and then smelt it? Why would an ancient non-technological culture have any reason to do that or desire to do that work? The gods wanted them to do that work for reasons we don't fully understand. Okay? And then since they found it so valuable, that value was transferred to these ancient people who did their work for them. Okay? And that gives us the so-called intrinsic value of gold today. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing as intrinsic value of gold. If you believe that, you are under mind control. Okay? Can you, here's what intrinsic value is. If there's a natural disaster, and you are living off the land with no technology, what can you do with the item that you have? That's called intrinsic value. If you can eat it, it has intrinsic value. If you can wear it, it has intrinsic value. If you can shelter yourself with it, it has intrinsic value. If you can defend yourself with it, it has intrinsic value. By the definition of the word, intrinsic means naturally occurring, having a natural utilization. There is no such thing as the intrinsic value of gold. The people who believe that are people who believe in monetary systems, which are an illusion and a religion. There's no such thing as the intrinsic value of gold unless you are in a highly technological civilization in which this rare earth metal is employed in technology. Okay? Other than that, there's no intrinsic value for gold. We use it in computers and other modern technologies, but nowhere else. You can't eat it, you can't shelter yourself with it, uh, you can't um, defend yourself with it, uh, and therefore it's not intrinsically valuable. Yet, this system that came to us from these beings has become the, the number one religion. And that's why I put it, when I showed the five boxes for consciousness, that's in the middle because that's the one that binds all the other religions together. It is the number one religion from the movie They Live, which I'll talk about later. That's humanity's God. And when gold and paper money become the god of a species, you better believe that they're going to remain enslaved. And maybe at that point it's deserved. Okay? So, and I know that'll offend a lot of people. And go ahead and get it. Get, my, my tagline in my radio series is get as offended as you like. Because I don't sugarcoat things or hold back. Okay? That's not my tact, and it will never be my tact. All right? So, kingship and royalty came from these extraterrestrial beings. Again, they appointed the kingship and the, the rulership in the ancient world to maintain control over the populations and act as intermediaries between the gods. Again, look, that's what religion is. A priest is an intermediary between people and God, supposedly. We go through him. Well, that's what the, the, religious, the religions of the ancient world were. The royalty of the ancient world were often demigods. They, that's why royalty is obsessed with bloodline. And that's why it's propagated through bloodline. It's not propagated through knowledge or what you know how to do or if you're a better person or more moral person than someone else. It's propagated through your blood, genetics, bloodline. The, the demigods had more of the gods' blood in them and therefore they were royalty, seen as royalty on the earth. And that's where all of these systems come from. Hence, the divine right to rule. I have a divine right to rule as the king because I, my blood is purer than your blood. I have more of the God's blood in me than you have in you. Therefore, I have the divine right to rule over you. 
It makes, here's my, the question I want you to keep putting in your mind with all of this is does it make sense? Does it make more sense than anything we've been told? Does it make more sense than anything we've been told about where these systems came from? And to me, yes it does. And again, of course, I'll be attacked for that and the debunkers will have a field day and go right ahead. The system of religion and kingship is known as the old world order. This was how the ancient rulers maintained control over the people. Up at the top of the pyramidal hierarchical structure where there was, is knowledge and down here there's ignorance which keeps the system in place, you had the king. The, the king or the priest, however you want to look at it. The king or the priest king, you know, any way you want to look at it. He ruled unquestioningly. All authority is vested in him. So this is the concept. The old world order was the concept of authority vested in one, in one being who ruled over all the others. This system is based entirely in violence because that's how a hierarchy of authority is maintained through violence. And it is built upon the erroneous, meaning completely untrue, wrong notion and the dogmatic belief. It's a dogmatic belief system, okay, which is a religion. That one person is the master who possesses the moral right to issue commands while all others are that being's subjects who have the moral obligations to obey the commands issued by the master. Okay? That was called royalty or kingship in the ancient world. And really, we, we, we still have kingships today. There are still kings in other countries okay? and qu queens in other countries. Um, instead of this euphemism, called the old world order or uh, uh, even authority or kingship. Who could tell me what this really is? Slavery. Let's stop euphemizing and call things what they really are. This is called slavery, okay? Backed by violence and it's not anything else, never was anything else, isn't anything else today and is never going to be anything else. It's called slavery. If you're being honest with yourself, which most people aren't. Okay, now, the reason I'm hammering that home so deeply is because we're going to look at the New World Order now and see what that is. Okay, so the New World Order is based on the concept of government. Okay, and government means from the Latin, and yes, this is the etymology, and yes, this is what it means. If you disagree with that, go and see my podcast on uh, New Age Bullshit, which I is podcast number 143 on my website. Okay. Government comes from the Latin verb gubernare, sometimes rendered in, in more modern or non-classical Latin as guvernare. Okay? Gubernare means to control. And then the second part of the word ment comes from the Latin noun mens mentis, which means mind. When you put them together, the word government literally means to control the mind. It is mind control. To believe in it, someone has to be under mind control because they have to believe in the erroneous concept of authority backed by violence, okay? That's what government is now, always has been, and always will be, whether anybody understands that or not, okay? Now, this is what the New World Order is based upon. We saw what the Old World Order was. It was ruled by one, a priest or a king, okay? The New World Order is you have a government on top of the structure. So now we're doing it's the same exact structure ruled by violence and built on the false claim of authority over other people, okay? And all you're doing is you're divesting that so-called authority, that power, okay, granted to the king, and you're just divesting it into a few people in the, the institution known as government. So this is authority vested in a group. The, the system is based entirely in violence and built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief or the religion that a certain group of people are masters who possess the moral right to issue commands while all other beings are subjects who have the moral obligation to obey the commands of the master. Once again, if you think there's any difference between this and the old world order, these are called opposames as David Icke likes to call them. They're not opposites, they're the exact same thing euphemized with a different word. It's all language, it's all word games, word magic, okay? Ultimately, it's the exact same core thing and that's called slavery. Nothing has changed. 
The old world order has just morphed into the new world order because people stopped believing overtly enough in the religious institutions and in the institution of kingship. That's it. So now the people in control of these institutions just said, well, let's just morph it and say, we're going to divest it into the hands of a few, just like their gods did. They set up these institutions in the ancient world to divest the power and stop making the people think, oh, it's only a few of these beings that clearly are not us ruling over us. And, and therefore, they more easily got the populations to go along with their slavery. The same thing is ruling the earth today, and nothing has changed in 200,000 years. Let's stop euphemizing these things and calling them what they are, okay? It's not kingship. It's called slavery ruled by one. It's not government. It's called slavery ruled by few. If you're being honest with yourself, there's that caveat. If you're being honest with yourself. Most people aren't being honest with themselves. They're lying to themselves because they hate themselves because they're dealing with unresolved psychological dynamics, okay, that bring up self-loathing and the refusal to accept personal responsibility, and no one wants to hear that spoken. Well, I'm going to speak it. I'm going to speak it. Go, let's go back to the tree of evil and really understand this psychological framework, okay? In light of the, so, the quote-unquote troubled human past, and that's the understatement of all time. Uh, I was thinking about, instead of calling this cosmic abandonment, it should be called cosmic rape, you know, or maybe cosmic partial birth abortion might be more accurate, all right? Um, but, you know, admittedly, we have a troubled past. Um, so in light of this troubled past and the origins of modern cultural institutions, the question is, do we now have a psychological framework through which to better understand the behavior of certain groups of human beings? Can we put certain behavioral uh, uh, groups of, of, of people into a, co a certain context behaviorally to better understand why they behave the way that they behave? So look at this tree. Willful ignorance, driven by the fear of owning your personal responsibility to do the right thing. Driven by underlying in the subconscious mind, self-loathing due to a lack of self-respect. Okay, because we've always been a slave race. And that's so nested in our ancestral DNA that we think it should continue for some reason. Okay, and then underneath that, the cosmic abandonment issues that we have been dealt with as a result of the events of the past. All right, let's look at certain groups of people. Thank you. I have a half an hour left. I'll try to speed through this. All right, rigid skeptics like this guy who's burning in hell right now, if there is a hell, guaranteed he's there. You know who that is? That's Philip Class. Okay, the biggest so called ufology uh, debunker of all time, who was now, it has finally come out, was a, on the payroll of the CIA and was working for the CIA the entire time he was doing all this debunking work. Okay. The biggest clown possibly in the history of the world, this, this, this punk, okay? All right? Uh, because, because he'll say he's a skeptic, but he's nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind, because if his daddy tells him it's true, well, then I believe daddy. I believe the CIA, because that's my daddy. This is how these nested psychological abandonment issues work. I can't look into the truth for myself, no matter how much evidence. Evidence be damned. Evidence be damned. Daddy told me it's this way. Okay? So I'm skeptical about everything. Unless, of course, the government or government-funded scientists say it's true. Then I'm a true believer. I'm a true believer because mommy and daddy told me it's true. Right. How about religionists in general, the followers of religion? The priest class we already talked about. Okay, the followers of religion I call the children of the gods, where Jay had a great term for it, the children of hierarchy. These are the people who love hierarchy. They love prostrating themselves before their gods, as if the God of creation would ever demand that of us. Because he's that vain, he, she, it is that vain, that force is that vain. No, the gods were that vain and cruel and sadistic. The God of creation is nothing like that. Okay, so... 
you know, uh, all religion is about is surrender. It's about surrender. It's not about actually getting to the truth. It's about accepting what we tell you. Okay? So, we believe what we're told to believe. If that is so much easier than developing critical thinking skills. That's what religion is. That, I'm just going to cut right to the core of what's going on psychologically with people like this. And I don't care who it offends. Okay? You listening out there, I don't care if you're offended by it. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what's true. Okay? Believers in government, or what I call the supporters of slavery. Look, in all honesty, we even have to drop this term statist. We got to start calling these people what they are. They're supporters of slavery. That's what these people are. Okay? And I don't care what brand they come in. Left, right, center, or, or otherwise. Okay? The Democrat, the liberal, the political leftist. He wants government, he, she wants government to be our caretaker from cradle to grave. Thinks that government should act as provider and nurturer like an archetypal mother. This is because there's abandonment issues in the motherly sense that are going on in most people like that. And if you go into people who are political leftist, liberal, Democrat types, okay? And yeah, I am generalizing, okay? You will find people with mommy issues, okay? <laughs> you will find people with mommy issues because what they want the government to be is the caretaker that's absent. So they want it to be mommy. I want mommy. And now government's going to be mommy. Okay? Now let's look at the opposite side. The oppo same. Okay? As David I calls it. The Republican, the conservative, the political right winger. Okay? They want government to be our protector. We want a strong government. It's got to be our protector. Police the world and keep us safe. Right? From cradle to grave, it's going to keep us safe, like an archetypal father figure, like the powerful, you know, protective father figure. Well, just like the Democrats and the political leftists have mommy issues, all the people on the right side who this is what they think government should exist to do have daddy issues. They want government to be daddy. Okay? That's the underlying psychological issues that these people have and don't even know they have. They don't even know they have these issues. All right? It's mommy and daddy didn't pay enough attention to me. So I want mommy and daddy present now. That's what this is about. That's what this is about. And let, look, let's not leave out the, min the minarchists. Okay? Let me just go back one there. The minarchist, the constitutionalist. This is the libertarian. I only want a little bit of government. I want government to beat me three days a week instead of seven. <laughs> Whip me three days a week, master, not seven, please. You know? The plantation on the other side of the hill only whips their slaves three days a week. You know? Here we get whipped seven days a week, so, so I want to go over to that plantation. You know, I mean, this is, this is absurdity. It's absurdity. And again, I don't usually speak that strongly out against these types of groups because they're almost there, but they're the people who are most of the way there, but they fear going all the way because they don't want to be labeled an anarchist. Or in other words, a non-supporter of slavery who think that, thinks that slavery should be abolished. God forbid. God's forbid. Okay, and yeah, I'm getting a little bit emotional. Because these people are, are the people who keep slavery going. They're, they're responsible. How much time do I have? Okay. Mainstream media is the next group who are psychological infants, children. They don't want to determine truth for themselves and report it in any kind of a responsible way or any kind of a direct way. They don't, they, all they care about is a paycheck. That's it. I'll get up there and lie to people for a paycheck. Write what you're told, mainstream media. Thanks, corporate news. The elite couldn't control the people without you. It's true, because these are the people who keep these topics from ever being explored. See, you don't need to eradicate occult knowledge or wisdom. You don't need to. All you have to do is have enough people dissuading people from looking into any of this and call it fringe and cast doubt on it and, and cast derision on it. 
You know, the ridicule factor. That's all. And then people go along with the herd like good little sheep and good little slaves. So these people, that what they're really saying is, I'm too much of a low-life coward to tell the truth, so I repeat lies for a paycheck. You know, that's all. And again, get as offended as you like. I don't care who you know in these institutions. I don't care who anybody out there knows in these institutions. This is what's really going on deep down inside in the psyche. These people are sick. You have to understand, I'm not just attacking these people. I'm trying to help you, somebody who is partially well, if not all the way well, to explain you're dealing with psychologically ill people. These are broken individuals that need healing and need to be put back together to remember who we really are. And we're not going to do it unless we deal with these issues. It's not going to be done unless the issues on this tree are dealt with. The New Agers, who I call the hopelessly naive, who want to believe, oh, you know, the, the, the aliens from, uh, from Pleiades are, are coming here in their giant battle cruisers to rescue us from our own ignorance any day now. You know, or no real knowledge is going to have to be done. We're going to have to meditate the world into a new way of being. Well, you're not going to have to actually study and read books and take up knowledge into yourself, God forbid. That might involve effort and work, and we can't have that, you know. So we're just going to sit in a lotus position and meditate all day. Okay? And the other things, they have just wildly off notions about how actual dynamics of, of the laws of attraction work that are completely unfounded and don't work the way that they're claiming that they work. Because they don't understand natural law. The New Age movement is put there as the last cul-de-sac before the gold mine to cut people off from an un a real understanding of natural law. And again, like I said, this presentation really goes hand in hand with my natural law seminar. All right? So that's going to be out probably by the end of this month. It'll be up on my website. It's 10 hours long. You have to watch that seminar when it's released. I go in depth with slides into what natural law is and how it works. All right? So these people are saying, we don't talk about the abuse mommy and daddy put us through. If you ignore it, it goes away on its own. Ignore the negative. Never talk about the negative ever, ever, ever because you're giving power to it. And that has absolutely nothing to do with how things really work. You have to expose what's going on. And then the, the, the knowledgeable yet inactive. These are all the people, oh, wait a minute. Here, I think I'm doing enough because I fast blast a few emails or because I go on some forums and have some arguments over some little detail in this researcher's work. You know what these people are? They're a bunch of clowns, okay? They're cowards. Let's put it, let's call them what they really are. All the people who do this, folks, cowards, cowards. I'll look right in the camera, I'll look right in their face and tell them. Cowards. Because you don't want to come out, you don't want to put your name on the line, come out with your real name and say, I stand against all forms of slavery and I'm going to do everything I can to abolish them. Okay? I'll hide behind a keyboard. I'll give myself a little pseudonym or, or an acronym name. And I'll attack other researchers on the little aspect that I think they got wrong. Instead of actually telling people what the truth is. In, in, a, in a way that can be readily understood by other people. Okay? They're armchair quarterbacks and they're lazy cowards. Okay? And here's what they're saying. I know all about what's going on in the world. Can't you see how well I'm putting all that knowledge to use? Can't you see what a great job I'm doing? So many people are inactive. Yeah. Order followers are next. The least mature and yet they're the most responsible. The absolutely most responsible people. Now how could the least mature be the most responsible people? Well, it's true. These people are the people who have not grown up ever, okay? And yet, they're the most responsible for what's going on in the world. They actually create the police state. These children, who I'm going to put images up on the screen, and if you can just, I, when, I, when I put these images up, I just want you to look into their eyes, okay? And you tell me if these people aren't children. You tell me, if you look in their eyes, look into the researcher's eyes I'll put up later and compare them to these people's eyes. Because they say the eyes are the windows to the soul. You tell me if these aren't psychological children. Okay? 
Now, there's the archetypal image of the abandoned child, okay? And here's the abandoned children who are trying to appeal to the approval of mommy and daddy. I want to appeal to the approval of daddy because mommy and daddy didn't pay enough attention to me in real life, so these are my, this is my surrogate family. I want to look all the same like a good little boy and girl that does what they're told on command, like a robot on command like a robot. Look into the eyes of these people. Tell me you don't see psychological children. I, I'll, I tell you there's something wrong with you if you don't see it, okay? Because you have to be completely unconscious not to see that these people have not grown up one iota from childhood. Not one. Yeah, though they're big and bad trying to take other people's rights away on command. Yeah. But here's what they really are, folks. We are the house slaves. We are the house slaves. No lower form of life than a house slave. And you know what? If anybody wants to try, I'll just say this. If anybody wants to try that, to make that a race issue, you go right ahead and try. Because the blood of Kem flows in my veins. Because my ancestors that I've traced back, my ancestral tree, go back to the land of Kem. Okay? So I can speak on that like that. And so could actually anybody else who's telling the truth. It's not a race issue. It's a truth issue. Okay? These are the house slaves. We'd rather enslave our own species, and ourselves included, rather than grow up, develop real courage, and think for ourselves. The researchers whose work I think you should really look into, and I'll get into solutions in a moment. Okay? You've got to look into these guys' work. Okay, write, it, write them down, look into them on your own. Eric Von Doniken, okay? Brilliant work. Chariots of the Gods, The Return of the Gods, and many other works. We have 15 minutes, I'll, I'll try to blast through this. Zechariah Sitchin, phenomenal and monumental amounts of work that he's done with the 12th planet, There Were Giants Upon the Earth, The Lost Book of Enki, and many others. Lloyd Pye, I dedicated the whole presentation to this gentleman. His work with the Star Child Skull is phenomenal. You have to check out the book, Everything You Know Is Wrong. You have to go online and download this guy's YouTube videos and watch them all. You have to understand Lloyd Pye's work. It is invaluable to this field of research. Michael Tellinger, most people don't know about him. I think he's gaining more notoriety and rightly so. The Slave Species of the Gods. You have to check this book out. It is required reading, as far as I'm concerned. David Icke, written incredible work, so well sourced, too. All the people who attack this guy's work, I guarantee you have never read his books. They've heard a clip, a snippet of one of his videos, and say, oh, I disagree with that. You gotta understand how well documented this guy's books are, and they're 600 page books, and he's written like 18 of them. Okay, so no small amount of research. It's monumental amounts of research. And I've always said in, in my work, if anybody, if the world if had a tenth of the courage of this man, we'd be free today. Credo Mutwa, who David Icke brought forward, he's a, a, a Zulu um, a shaman. Uh, I, I believe they call them Sanusi in, in the Zulu culture. Uh, you got to check out the video, The Reptilian Ag Agenda. This guy's a library of knowledge. Michael Tessarion. How many people are familiar with this gentleman? Okay. If you're not familiar with Michael Tessarion, I don't know what to tell you. You have to become familiar with him. Uh, you have to watch the whole series of Origins and Oracles. How many people have actually sat down and watched all 22 discs of Origins and Oracles? Raise your hand. And, and I, there's one person who's not here. I think Jay stepped out of the room. He has four people in the room. That's unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. This work is one of the most important works in modern history. You have to get these DVDs. Get them from a friend. See, talk to me. I, I have them. I can copy them for you. Okay? You have to watch these DVDs. All right? Graham Hancock. Fingerprints of the Gods, Lost Knowledge of the Ancients, Knowledge of the Lost Civilizations. Michael Cremo, Forbidden Archaeology, brilliant work. Uh, somebody who I've been following recently, L.A. Marzulli, brilliant work on the, the, the Nephilim and the Watchers. The Watchers video series is one of the best documentary series I've seen recently. I highly recommend it. 
comes at things from a little bit more of a biblical perspective, but hey, his research is great. David Hatcher Childress, again, mostly dealing with the technology of the ancients. Trey Smith, another person who's done a lot of great videos on the Nephilim and genetic manipulation of humanity. Giorgio Tsoukalos, I think, did a lot of great work in the early parts of Ancient Aliens. Here's, he's looking a little tame in this picture, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I like his early work. Uh, you know, I think some of the, the later uh, seasons uh, fell a little bit short of what he was doing in the earlier seasons, but I think the earlier seasons of Ancient Aliens should definitely be checked out. Emmanuel Velikovsky, Worlds in Collision, uh, about the history of our early solar system. Robert Schock has done some great work on the uh, dates of some of the ancient uh, megalithic structures. Check out his work as well. Uh, Alan and Dallaire wrote the book Cataclysm about the deluge in ancient times. I think that's a book definitely worth checking out. Allegories that we see this, wor this story told about in modern, in modern fiction, okay? They live story about alien takeover of the earth and how only a certain group of people can see them who have the drive and the desire to, to see the subliminal messages and the mind control that they put out. Roddy Piper was the star, probably my favorite movie of all time. If anyone hasn't seen They Live, it's required viewing. The tales about these two brothers who come to a less advanced civilization and, and one of them wants to become a king. The man who would be king, it's the tale by Rudyard Kipling told in, in the movies again. Uh, and then a remake of this, The Road to El Dorado, which was, uh, I believe, put forward out of uh, DreamWorks. And uh, again, the two brothers, one of them wants to rule the city of El Dorado and get all the gold. They came for the gold. They stayed for the adventure. <laughs> oh, what an adventure it is. The story of Thor, of course, is the story of the brothers en uh, Enki and Enlil, okay? Uh, with, their, with their king Anu who is Odin in the Norse tradition. These are the gods, and the Norse, it's just, the, 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 it's just been retold. Uh, this would be Enki, this would be Enlil, and this would be Anu. It's just retold, and of course the gods have a penchant for earth women, you know? It's all there in Hollywood, they're telling you. The island of Dr. Moreau about the genetic manipulation of humanity, this is just an allegory. We're on the island of Dr. Moreau, it's called the Earth, okay? and. Um, it says, through DNA experimentation, Dr. Moreau has upset the balance of nature. He has turned animals into humans, and now heaven has turned into hell. Right on the cover of a DVD box. A story about um, resources being taken from different cultures and, and mined. Dune, the spice being mined. This is like the Anunnaki coming for the gold. And again, it's an allegory about what we're doing to other countries with oil, and like Avatar. Same, same theme, an extraterrestrial culture comes to another planet, exploits the resources and kills the people and you know, uh, it's, it's, it's like them coming to the earth for the resources they wanted and what we're doing, because that's what our parents taught to us, we're doing the same here and exploiting third world countries for their resources. Great allegory, that's why it was so popular and I think it might still be the top grossing film of all time. <clears throat> the Matrix trilogy, which I've done another uh, series on, uh, video series, uh, this is uh, uh, another allegory about the takeover by non-human intelligence uh, over humanity and making them into a slave race. Again, in this it's depicted as AI or artificial intelligence, but just substitute the artificial intelligence for these extraterrestrial beings. Substitute AI for ET and you have the same basic story. Star Trek Deep, Deep Space Nine, a brilliant allegory about this, about this race of founders who are shapeshifters and who control this other race of reptilian-like creatures who are called the Jem Hadar, okay? And they, they keep them on drugs, which is called white, which they pump into their neck, and that's an uh, allegory for adrenaline, keeping the, the police hopped up and addicted to adrenaline, you know, uh, and keeping them acting as the, the house slaves for the designs of the founders. It's a great allegory. There's a lot of other allegorical stuff in Deep Space Nine as well, which I don't have time to get into. Perhaps the best allegorical movie to check out regarding this ancient story, which was crushed in Hollywood and crushed in newspaper reviews. Whenever they don't want you to see a movie, they're going to crush it in the reviews to dissuade as many people from seeing it as possible. This is one of the best movies ever made about the true origins of humanity and the ancient story of what happened on this planet. And I guarantee you hardly anybody has seen it. How many people have seen this movie? Look at that. Five people in the room. Okay? Battlefield Earth 
It was written by L. Ron Hubbard, okay? And it was made into a Hollywood movie. Look at the similarities in the skull type, okay? And this is the, the giants, and he's holding him up by the throat. That's how tall they are, okay? This story, very positive, though, because it talks about the role of knowledge and the importance of knowledge in understanding how to get out of this slave culture, okay? Highly recommend Battlefield Earth. Part three and last, I probably have like five minutes left, okay? I'll try to speed through this, all right? The unwritten story of our future. It's about understanding the abuse victim cycle and how to get out of it, okay? When a traumatic uh, event or abuse occurs, the abuser uh, the person who experiences it either identifies with the abuser or the victim, and therefore they continue to, to uh, repeat the cycle, okay? Only when we have enough knowledge, care, and willpower can we break the abuse victim cycle. And I talk about this a lot in my podcast. Go back to the ones I did on that and check it out. It's about balance between the brain such that we're not in master think or slave think. Again, in my podcast, I cover this extensively. When you're in left brain imbalance, it leads to um, a masculine domination, the suppression of the emotion, and eventually roots us into the lower brain, the reptile brain, okay? If you're in right-brained imbalance, okay, that roots us in the mammalian brain, which means that our emotions are out of control, and we're not really stepping up with, with uh, confidence, with courage, and standing up for our rights. We go into slave think mentality. He healing this divide, balancing both hemispheres of the brain by working with these different uh, brain uh, dynamics holistically is the way out of that, um, you know, uh, imbalance. Genetics versus epigenetics. I just want to say here that I feel the power of consciousness can trump anything that has been done to us genetically. So to leave people with a little bit of hope, the answer is consciousness, and that could that could totally break any of the genetic programming that these beings have done to us, no matter how deep. Okay, no matter how deeply seated it is. But that's if we take the time to explore the knowledge of ourselves. If you want to look into how epigenetics can trump genetics, really look into the works of Dr. Bruce Lipton, cell biologist. His work, The Biology of Belief, is absolutely essential to that matter. Okay? Self-loathing is the underlying psychological condition that causes people to attempt to abdicate their own personal responsibility, to exercise conscience, and fall into the patterns of willful ignorance, order following, and the justification of immoral behavior. Self-loathing is created when early, earlier psychological trauma has been suppressed and buried into the subconscious mind, instead of being confronted, dealt with, and healed. The effects of such unresolved trauma often take the forms of form of feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness, whether those feelings are real, suggested, or imagined. And this is the dynamic of a self-loather. I have suffered, therefore I shall cause, cause suffering unto others. That cycle has to be broken, and this is the exact mindset, okay? I've suffered, therefore I'm going to cause suffering, that keeps people in the prison of their own making. Five minutes, great. Self-respect from the Latin re meaning again and spectare meaning to look at is the only thing that can ultimately heal self-loathing and therefore help to put humanity on the path to healing and conscience. Self-respect ultimately means to take another look at oneself. Respect, to look at again, to look at the self again, to go in and understand the aspects of human consciousness. Okay? We have, these are what I call the three R's. Respect, remembrance, and responsibility. Respect, remembrance, and responsibility is the path out of this prison. Okay? Self-respect, taking another look at the self. Remembering who we really are. Okay? Self-knowledge, knowledge of self. W the ways that we can express our own consciousness is through thought, emotion, and action. This is the real holy trinity that exists within each one of us. It's been called the mind-body-spirit connection. The masculine and feminine aspects together with the creative aspects of the mind, the thoughts. To be unified such that we are a being that as we think, so we feel, so we act, and there's no contradiction between those three modes of consciousness. Here's the expressions, thought, emotion, and action, the fulfillments of which are the fulfillments of thoughts are knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. The fulfillments of emotion are true care, empathy, and compassion. The fulfillments of action are courage, willpower, and persistence. This is what humanity needs to develop. If we stay in the failures of thought, emotion, and action, we stay in the prison. 
The failures of thought are ignorance, foolishness, and naivete. The failure of emotion is apathy, indifference, and callousness. The failure of action is cowardice, laziness, and submission. Okay? That's the basic knowledge chart that we need to take into ourselves and understand how we work because our controllers know how the human consciousness works and they've done the, our, their best to keep that knowledge from us. We have to understand our own sovereignty. Sovereign is a word derived from Latin, the adverb super meaning above, and the noun regnum meaning rulership or control. Thus, sovereign means one who is above the rulership or control of another, or in a word, free. Sovereignty, the word sovereign, simply means, ladies and gentlemen, not a slave. It doesn't mean anything else. It never has meant anything else. It means that you are the ruler of yourself, and no one else rules over you externally. It means you are not a slave. Every person in the world is sovereign whether they know it or not. Slavery is illegitimate. None of us are legitimately slaves, therefore we are all sovereigns. Sovereigns. An individual's personal responsibility to choose right action over wrong action for themselves is always their own. One can only make the claim that they can, quote, abdicate their personal responsibility for such choice, for such decision to someone else. This can never actually be done in reality. More simply put, an individual is always responsible for their own behavior, for their own actions. We need to grow up, think for ourselves, and stop following orders. Following orders is not a virtue, it is the path to total destruction. It is the path to slavery. It should not be looked at as a virtue. Really wrapping this up, the bottom line of all of this is, regardless of how troubled our cosmic childhood may have been, humanity's childhood is over, ladies and gentlemen. Humanity's childhood is over and a choice stands before us all. That choice is either to enter cosmic adulthood or perish. That is the choice that stands before humanity right now and is up to each one of us to make. The path to that cosmic adulthood is the understanding of natural law and how to apply it in our lives. That is the master key which the universe has given to us that is the pathway to freedom that can unlock all the locks on all the doors to all the cages. Okay? Natural law is the answer. Okay? And what the universe is beckoning us and calling us forth to do, ladies and gentlemen, in two words, what the universe is beckoning us and calling us forth to do on this planet is to break our chains and to end slavery to end slavery. When we do that, and not a moment until, maybe we will be able to create a new world that is really worth living in for ourselves and our children, and then maybe we will be able to go off world and join our other benevolent brothers and sisters in the stars. Thank you very much.